Welcome to another episode of Wisdom of Pen. Pen Ching Fu was a real old school uh, fighting martial arts teacher and he appeared in some movies. He was in Shaolin Temple with Jet Li, uh, Iron and Silk, Talons of the Eagle, and I studied with him for oh, close to 30 years. And throughout that time, um, every class, he would write down a bunch of uh, sayings for me or knowledge in Chinese, and, uh, and then he'd help me translate them into English and then put them into a perspective for me. So over the years, I gathered up uh, lots and lots of notes from, from that time together. He passed away a couple of years ago, so I wanted to share these notes uh, so that it doesn't really get lost in, uh, in history and uh, it can benefit the community. Now this week I was translating a video, it was a short documentary uh, made in Wudong in China about uh, the Bajichuan uh, style of Kung Fu. And I came across a quote in the um, documentary that made me remember that uh, Pen Jing Fu had written out this quote for me in the past. And then it got me to thinking about how he explained it and how he kind of related it uh, back to our martial arts practice. So I thought it'd be an interesting one to share. So the quote actually goes uh, like this in Chinese, and then I'll, I'll break it down and I'll explain it to you in English and then give you the meaning. So in Chinese, it goes like this. Wen you tai ji an tian xia, wu you ba ji ding qian kun. So if you look at it literally, it translates uh, like this. Culture has tai chi, so under all heaven is peaceful. Military has baji, so heaven and earth are stable. So what does that all mean? It turns out there's some real history and real profound meaning and poetry to this phrase. Um, so let, let's take a look at, uh, at where it comes from. The quote is attributed to Emperor Qianlong. In Chinese, it's Qianlong Huangdi. He ruled in the Qing Dynasty for about 60 years in the 1700s. He spoke six languages and had a very successful military, cultural, and economic reign in his time. Uh, legend has it that when Emperor Qianlong was traveling near the Shaolin Temple, he observed both Tai Chi, Tai Chi Chuan, and Baji, Baji Chuan and was really impressed by both styles of martial arts and their polar differences. Taiji Chuan is an internal martial art. It relies on softness and suppleness to be effective, but there's a component of hardness and strength hidden inside the softness. A Baji Chuan, by contrast, is an external martial art. It emphasizes hard strength and explosive force. There's, however, a component of softness hidden inside that hardness. It also happens that Emperor Qianlong's paternal uncle was a second generation master of Ba Ji Chuan. A being martial artist enthusiast himself, and having had relatively close contact with these two styles, this led Emperor Qianlong to say this, with these two distinctively opposite arts of Tai Ji Chuan and Ba Ji Chuan coming together, the world is stable and at peace. So we can kind of break this down, so with is Yo and then these two distinctly opposite martial arts. So if we put Wen and Wu together, it's kind of like soft and hard. Of Tai Ji Chuan, written like this, and Ba Ji Chuan, written like this, coming together the world, and the world we can say Qian Xia or Qian Kun, is stable and at peace, An Ding. So it's hard to provide a direct translation to this. So you kind of have to look at the, the different layers of how this, this is built up. Uh, so if we put it here on the screen, I can kind of show you how he's kind of matched up uh, the different characters, different words, to give them kind of like a, a, a more of a depth of meaning. So if we look here, you can see this word, when. In itself, it actually means culture or language and not really soft. A wu means martial or fighting and not really hard. But when you put these two words together in each opposite part of the phrase, um, they, when they come together, they're actually mean, meaning to contrast between two opposites. So the scholar versus the soldier, or hard versus soft, um, the gentry versus the military, the thinker versus the fighter, brains versus brawn. So it's really like yin and yang. So yin and yang, these two characters, um, if you want to consider it that way. 
Now, an, which is peace, and ding, which is stability, are complements. So they also make up a compound word in Chinese, an ding. And an ding, the compound word, is peace and stability. So also, Emperor Qianlong, you know, he's choosing to associate Tai Chi Chuan with peace or tranquility, kind of the soft characteristics. And then he's associating, associating Ba Ji Chuan with this character, which is firmness and stability, kind of hard characteristics and not really the other way around. So they're saying peace and stability, but they're doing it from two opposing perspectives. Now, if we look at Qian Xia, all under heaven, and Qian Kun, heaven and earth, these are really synonyms for the, uh, the word, uh, the world. And they're, um, they both kind of basically mean the world, but by using two different synonyms for it, um, it's a way to kind of balance out uh, these two lines, these two couplets. So the words Tai and Ba, they deserve some mention here too in the two martial arts. So although we tend to interpret um, Tai as sort of uh, really excessively in modern uh, Chinese, it actually, when we uh, talk about it in Tai Chi, or Tai Chi, it actually means supreme or the highest or the grandest, that kind of thing. And then Ba, in addition to literally meaning eight, um, Chinese tend to use it um, when referring to all directions or many directions, um, alluding to the eight directions of the Bagua um, on the traditional Luopan compass. So we actually get a saying from that actually uh, that, uh, that is Simian Ba Fang, and that means uh, four faces and eight directions. So if you kind of put these two concepts together, um, tai and ba, then you get kind of an overall concept of all-encompassing, um, alluding to the um, all-encompassing, necessary and sufficient nature of these two martial arts in unison. So the whole idea is these two martial arts are fully complete and realized in their own way. So finally, actually, if you look at the second component of Tai Chi and Ba Ji, then it's this character here. And this character, um, for these two polar opposite martial arts, happen to share this, this same word, Ji, which means kind of ultimate and extreme uh, in their names. So that adds kind of like a paradox of sorts. So both are ultimate martial arts in their respective uh, domains. So what you end up with is a, a full sentence. Now, if you try to translate the sentence literally, um, it would really just mean, you know, culture has Tai Chi, so all under heaven is peaceful. Military has Baji, so heaven and earth are stable. Um, so that literal trans translation, it doesn't really work, doesn't really give you the full meaning, the full essence and the spirit behind Emperor Qianlong's remark. Um, so you kind of lose that, uh, that meaning. So the number of layers underlying what may look like just uh, 14 characters on the surface is truly, truly amazing. There's a real depth and a real profound kind of meaning here. So this kind of leads me, when Master Pen wrote this out, and then I came across this again when I was translating it, I'll link below the, uh, the video I was translating it for, where I've got kind of a shorter version of this description in there just to explain this comment. But it's a really interesting sort of mini documentary on Baji Chuan. Uh, so I'll put that link below. But it leads me to one of um, Master Pan's um, sort of unique sayings, uh, one of his own sayings, that he really kind of tied together uh, with, with this uh, quote. And his saying was, every martial art has something special. So here we have a saying that solidly illustrates two very different martial arts um, and their opposing values, but also showing that hey, they have a real solid contribution to martial arts in general and to society. So Master Pan uh, was of course a, a Chinese martial art artist uh, practicing what you would call Kung Fu. Um, you know, here in the West, uh, in, in China, they would really call it Wushu, literally meaning martial arts. And he practiced mostly a, a Northern uh, set of uh, styles of, uh, of Kung Fu. But he had lots of exposure to different uh, styles of martial arts and Kung Fu. 
and he tried to take examples from them and learn from them to really kind of enrich his own uh, brand of, uh, of martial arts that uh, that you know he was building up an experience level with from training in uh, different parts of China with different masters. So when he was a preteen, kind of early teenager, that's when he started. Um, winning tournaments, national tournaments in China. So for his age class, he would be the, the, the top champion for, for the year um, in oh, a particular style or in a particular um, uh, sparring fight, that kind of thing. Um, and he found out as soon as that happened, he started getting people coming to his door on a regular basis, um, just unannounced, and challenging him to, uh, to fight. So he'd have to go out in the street in front of his house and, and fight these guys. So I remember him telling me that you know he'd get a knock on the door. And he'd be really surprised that uh, you know him as a, a young teenager, he'd find these sort of big guys uh, coming to challenge him and call him out uh, to kind of prove that uh, that he is a champion. Uh, so he'd have to uh, fight them in the street. He'd beat them in the street, um, and. Uh, but he was exposed to lots of different styles of Chinese martial arts, Chinese Kung Fu at the time by doing that. And he tried to really take a lesson from, from each one of them. What was it that was sort of hard for him to counter? What kind of attack did they have that was really good? Did they have a particular punch or a kick or, or, or a way of defending themselves that was uh, really special? And he tried to really remember that and, and try to integrate that a little bit into his own martial arts. So he was really known to travel all over China, kind of searching out special things. He'd find out uh, a master that had, you know, a really special kick or a special weapon that they were training or a special kind of defense or a really great takedown. Um, or they were excellent in, uh, in uh, sparring or combat. Uh, and really um, find these people that uh, that he really wanted to learn something specific. And sometimes he'd go and just learn one thing, one specific thing um, from their whole arsenal of martial arts, something that he thought was really, really special. Now later when he was a martial arts professor or a professor at the uh, Beijing Physical Education University, he would get delegations of foreign fighters coming sometimes, uh, trying to um, you know, learn about uh, Chinese Kung Fu, but also really to, to challenge Chinese martial arts. So he had the opportunity to fight a lot of these people. Uh, so he would fight people from different countries. Uh, I remember him telling me about uh, fighting somebody from Japan at one point, and being really impressed with the, uh, you know, the physical strength of, of the person that he was fighting. Um, and, uh, and really liking the way some of the guys' joint locks and everything like that worked. So he would try to really, you know, he'd fight and he'd, he'd, have, to, uh, he'd have to win to sort of save face for, uh, for the university and for the country. But um, he would really try to learn something from them. You know, they'd build, you know, real camaraderie after the fight and they would often teach each other different things from their different styles and really try to appreciate and learn what, uh, what the other one knew. As a coach of the national team, a few, few of the different national teams at different times, he'd end up doing uh, tours around, um, around Asia and around Europe mostly. And so we bring the team to do demonstrations and tours and that kind of thing. And so he'd always really be on the lookout uh, for interesting local martial arts. And he'd really try to take something um, or learn something or just really appreciate uh, what they were all about. I remember him telling me he specifically um, was impressed with uh, Indonesian martial arts and Thai martial arts. Um, so that was, that was uh, you know, something that he always did, was try to find something really kind of special in each one of these locales. So while it's in our nature to really think that the martial art that we're doing is the best, you know, the most unbeatable, the most suitable, that kind of thing, um, it's really good to kind of look out uh, for other martial arts and see what they have inside them that's uh, really, really worthwhile kind of digging deeper into and investigating. And doing that will really help enrich your own martial art. So respecting another martial art doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be a big fan of the martial art. You don't have to train that martial art to respect it. You don't have to even try it. You don't even have to like that martial art. But respecting it means you're really taking um, an appreciative look at it and seeing what are its characteristics and is there any part of those characteristics that you can actually use to help improve and enrich yourself. 
So we're usually drawn to martial arts through either opportunity, there's something close to us, or, or a teacher or, or a friend kind of brings us in, um, or there's something, something about that martial art we see that we really like and we go and search it out, or maybe it's something that really kind of suits our physical characteristics, our physique. Um, and we get drawn to that and, and we really sort of get into that martial art, really do a deep dive training in that martial art and it becomes sort of your whole world and that's, that's totally fine. It's great to, to, to take that and, and make it really part of you. But what's really valuable is then looking outside of that martial art, seeing what else is out there and seeing you know, how that can, um, sort of realizing what is special in another martial art can really enrich and improve your own practice. There's always going to be infighting and challenges in the martial arts world with people wanting to show which style is the best. That's not going to change and in the world of instant communications it tends to get amplified so with the internet, uh, YouTube, social media these arguments can tend to um, amplify, escalate, uh, you know the debate gets larger and larger. But the more we're exposed to other martial arts, the more we can hopefully see what makes them special. Well, I hope you found this interesting and useful and that it'll allow you to uh, improve and enrich your practice. Well, I hope you found this interesting and useful and that it'll allow you to uh, improve and enrich your martial arts. And if you did, hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more of these. And put in the comments down below um, if you want to see more of these Master Pan stories. And also put in the comments below something special about your martial art, something that's really unique, something that you really appreciate. I'd also like to thank Yan Wen Sang on helping me understand the history and cultural background of this saying. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video. Enjoy your training.